Uh, who would like to start us off uh, with questions? We don't have questions, they'll go back to the slide, but uh, why don't we just give you a, a chance, Grace? Um, you want to just, for everybody here, just when uh, I call upon you if you want to say who you are. Sure. Um, hi, uh, I'm in my last semester here, um, studying in PTS, and I'm also a graduate research assistant at CNS. Um, so my question is for all three of you, or any one of you, um, so I noticed that you took different um, levels of analysis in your approaches um, in these historical events. Um, so I'm wondering, I guess, moving forward, do you think it is most compelling to say that um, any change in U.S.-Russia relations and any arms control or defense issues will be um, most affected by, I guess, different personalities? For instance, um, you know, someone, uh, a certain individual taking on a role either in the U.S. leadership or Russian leadership, or do you think there's some other type of institutional change or maybe um, critical event that would spur on it, that would more likely spur on such a change in relations? Who wants to pick it up? Okay, Sarah. Okay, I'll take one, because um, I think we can all, as you said, probably argue to different mm -hmm. um, answers here, but, you know, I see... Um, a role in particular for personalities and for a big incident. So in my case study, for example, <clears throat> and actually in both of the case studies that I contributed to the volume, there was one really pressing threat or incident or non-proliferation kind of pressure that forced the United States and the Soviet Union to get beyond whatever differences they had and make use of their admittedly already very good cooperative channels. So I think that an incident, unfortunately, could be something that really brings the United States and Russia together today. That being said, I think across all of our case studies and when you buy a copy of the book and read it, um, you'll see that you know the personalities really do make a huge difference. And it isn't just the way that policy gets filtered through an individual or you know, um, relayed in a, in a particular fashion. I think it has to do with as Nikolai just highlighted, feeling like your interlocutor is an honest broker and feeling like the policy that they're representing and what they say they can or cannot do is not, um, it is genuine that you're butting up against the limits of what they're able to do, but they are willing to work with you within what they can do. And I think um, we don't have that kind of trust today, but in our recommendations, we talk about the need to build up this new cadre of you know, U.S. and Russian experts, which obviously is something we're doing in a dual degree program, but also just knowing that you can genuinely trust the other person to represent their constraints. Did you, Paul, did you want to, everybody wants to weigh in? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I can jump in. Um, you know, at least the kind of obvious example that comes to mind for the kind of role of personalities is, you know, Gorbachev and Reagan, and how these two formed a kind of personal relationship <laughs> over their terms in power, and how um, those interactions kind of led to, you know, landmark treaties like the INF, um, you know, the Reykjavik Summit, and, and other kind of thaws and relations. Um, you know, whether or not we have that kind of those personalities now is, you know, not up for today. We don't. Um, so, <laughs> um, I, I also think that, at least in my case study, uh, you know, I saw kind of a lot of interactions between high-level U.S. and Soviet officials. So. At least in the kind of MPT and PE discussion, I saw, uh, you know, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, um, you know, meet on multiple occasions with, you know, Anatoly Dubernin, the Soviet ambassador to Washington, um, and that kind of over the course of these kind of frequent interactions, they built um, a kind of basis of trust that ultimately led to their uh, cooperation and alignment on, you know, PEs and Article Five. So. Um, you know, Nicola, I kind of mentioned we don't have these interactions anymore, and we see the fallout as a result of that. Uh, so, kind of restoring this, these habits of cooperation is kind of essential to any future cooperation. Um, you know, I would say that individuals do not matter that much. Yes, that's important, but don't overestimate that. Uh, and just keep in mind that that crisis over state level concept was under Obama, it was not under Trump. Mm. So the fact of the Obama or White House did not have a policy on Russia, right? Mm. Uh, they had like a number of policies in which 
um, um, Moscow factor kind of in, but it did not have like a separate policy from Russia. And there was not that much interest in fact of, sort of, sort of in maintaining these contexts. And that's why uh, I say that uh, one big important change is the new international system and uh, uh, the lower kind of uh, place of Russia in that system. Is, and that's one uh, of the reasons why the United States does not really see a lot of need to talk to Russia you know, uh, all the time to maintain these channels uh, to develop these uh, uh, Oh, relationships. Uh, so yeah, that started way before Trump. Yeah, I don't like Trump, but please don't so, blame him for everything. Yes, if you really want to uh, find kind of the source, yes, that's actually all in my view. Oh, so, uh, George W. Bush uh, mm -hmm. and his team. Uh, uh, but Obama did continue. So in terms of Russia, the non-proliferation, he did not really do all of all that well, except for so, so, our JCPOA, uh, but I will say the JCPOA for Obama so, so, was an exception so, to his policy. This was not the rule. It's, it's, In my view, I might be wrong, all right, but that's I mean, how it, I see it. It's a, it's a complex issue, and I don't think, I think we're touching at, at different parts, parts of the explanation, but uh, I think you can't uh, emphasize enough the fact that for an extended period of time you had a process in place. And so you had routine meetings at an assistant secretary level every six months at which all kinds of issues were discussed, any issue that either side wanted to talk about. And so they didn't always agree, but you had a sense that it was important for them to meet and to table these issues, so there was a process in place. There are differences in terms of the importance of personalities if you're talking about at the presidential level, or if you're talking about at an assistant secretary or ambassadorial level. And so, uh, uh, simply saying that personalities matter, while true, doesn't really answer uh, the question. By the same token, uh, you also had institutions in place that had developed positions that were represented by individuals uh, that changed over time. So they're very different institutions in both governments mm. now uh, that promote different policies. Mm. So all of these things kind of combine. So there's, there's not a simple kind of answer to your question. Mm. We could talk more about it. It's a very good one. Bill, mm. one last kind of remark. I actually wanted to, uh, to support Sarah on what you said on the role of the events and crisis. It is, and I think, uh, sadly, I don't see any prospect for improving or non proliferation cooperation except that we got a major crisis of some of some sort, possibly a shooting crisis even. I don't know, yes, and then yes, we will suddenly stop and think, oh my god, yes. We should really change that. Let me ask, let me provide you with one kind of recommendation, and then I'd say, are you, are you are Yeah, I have a question. I'll, I'll call upon you just a moment. So, Something that I think is really both necessary and feasible that we recommend in the book, and something that we will do in one fashion or another through our own uh, PrEP 1.5, 2, 2.5, you know, meetings one way or another, uh, and that is to undertake either a, a joint uh, threat assessment uh, or parallel threat assessments. And we've, I've talked with senior people in, in both governments about this who think that it's feasible. And so they, they, I, and it's not simply in terms of the United States and the Russian Federation, this could apply across the board to nuclear weapon uh, states, non-nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states, proponents of the, of the Prohibition Treaty, or critics and the like. But to have them uh, as systematically as possible identify what they consider to be uh, the major uh, proliferation challenges or nuclear threats that they, that they face. Um, because I think it's, it's a way of kind of mapping out more empirically uh, where they stand and it may make it easier to identify areas where cooperation might be possible. I mean we know intuitively where, where there should be overlap but we haven't really undertaken you know such a simple uh, approach. And so we will at least do it in our own TRAP 1.5 meetings. 
Um, but without going into more detail, we've, I had discussions recently with uh, uh, actual policymakers who think that uh, even in our difficult climate, it might be possible to do something of this sort, which I think would be helpful. Sam? Um, yeah, thank you. That was, that was, that was great. Um, first of all, I, I wonder if there's any, if you did a case study of the ABM tree at all, if that was part of it. No. Because um, I, 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 it seems to me that if there's one significant, you know, post-Cold War uh, event in the U.S.-Russian uh, relationship, it is the end of the... Uh, the ABM Treaty, and I wonder if, even if one can imagine um, a future where the, the United States finds it politically acceptable to, in some way, internationalize uh, uh, missile defense uh, decision making, would there be any appetite uh, in Russia for a return to, to that sort of uh, framework? Nikolai, you want to? Uh, no, uh, no, we did not cover the ABM treaty simply because the study was on the NBT yeah, uh, yeah. in general, uh, non-proliferation mm -hmm. uh, is although ABM treaty, the nuclear arms control and disarmament do belong to Article 6, mm. uh, but the topic is so vast it would uh, simply make the second volume just out of one article. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so it, uh, I guess it was just not uh, are not actually practical, but yes, uh, yes, I agree. It's an extremely interesting case study. Mm. Uh, uh, both the historical part would be truly fascinating, especially given how uh, the United States and the Soviet Union did uh, change kind of places several times, mm. accepting uh, 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 the position of the other. Uh, yes, one actually. Our guest negotiator, uh, let's start one talk, so I don't remember exactly, uh, once remarked that the Soviet Union and the United States always uh, uh, adhere to the same position of uh, uh, missile defense, uh, but at different times. <laughs> um, uh, yes, and the prospect that you raised about more international decision making mm -hmm. missile defense is. Uh, uh, Quite fascinating, but I'm afraid it's going to be a good difference. <laughs> Please, maybe All next right. time. <laughs> yeah, William Smith, I'm the VIS and Emo Dual Degree Program. Um, quick question, uh, just for all three of you guys, just kind of curious to get your thoughts. So, especially looking back, obviously we are noting a lot of, you know, the personal relationships being a key factor between uh, the Soviet Union and uh, the United States. And I mean, Dr. Parr mentioned and Grace mentioned, kind of bring this conversation to fold. Um, I'm just curious, you know, with analysis today and maybe going forward and looking back today, the Soviet Union, I mean, they didn't really have civil society. You know, the, the amount of what we know is with the big four or the big five, um, and there's still a lot of research coming out about the Soviet Union, about kind of like the internal power uh, dynamics. I'm curious today, though, because we're in a very different time where civil society does play a key role, um, is it important for civil society to analyze civil society's own interactions between different countries and how that actually impacts policy decisions between two countries, or is that redundant in of itself? Uh, Sarah. I can, I mean, I think there's one um, vivid example having just come back from right. the NPT PrepCom. I mean, I'm thinking in particular about the role that civil society played in getting the ban treaty mm -hmm. negotiated um, and that it will probably continue to play in moving towards entry into force. I mean, I do think that um, as we, it is important to look at the ways that civil society can influence policy and interactions between civil society in different countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know sitting here at CNS and thinking about the dual degree program, mm -hmm. how important and how impactful civil society interaction can be um, I, I do think that in many of the cases that we look at, um, just thinking back, there probably wouldn't be a huge role for mm -hmm. civil society to have played in these very kind of nitty gritty diplomatic interactions. I'm not sure that there really would have been a channel for them to influence. But thinking, for example, about Paul's case study and thinking about, um, you know, the future of the CTBT entry into force or something like that, there were powerful ways in which domestic actors who were not necessarily in government 
push the agenda forward. So it's an interesting question, and it's one that we, I don't think, really touch upon in our findings other than to talk about the need to facilitate this right. new cadre of, you know, of experts who know the issues very well. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we're kind of, we're playing a role in that mm -hmm. right now just by having written this book and having looked at these particular issues. Right, yeah. Yeah, it seems, it seems obvious just by like the, mm -hmm. you know, the research in itself. That's what okay. I was kind of referring to. Mm -hmm. like it's, it does seem like it's obvious because we're doing it. Mm -hmm. well, I think just uh, kind of one interesting point of contrast between the role civil society played perhaps um, in the US Soviet context and to what you see now. Uh, you know, at least in the 70s, kind of the arms control debate and you know, arms race was a kind of fixation in the public um, sphere. You know, congressional hearings were, I guess, kind of prime time TV. Uh, you know, rat ratification debates were kind of closely followed by, you know, most of kind of US public. Um, so you had a kind of, I think, more intense public investment in the U.S.-Soviet strategic <coughs> relationship than uh, we see now, where you know I'm assuming you know the people who watched New Start ratification hearings was you know <laughs> below 2,000 on C-SPAN, um, and that you know I think very few people even know, at least in the U.S. kind of public sphere, what New Start is, you know what's happening to INF. Um, and I think that kind of affects you know what U.S. policy is towards Russia. Um, you know there was a lot of kind of public pressure to engage in talks or not to. I mean, the, the debate was much richer and I think more um, intellectually profound than it is now. And I think that affects um, our relationship with Russia. Uh, yeah, I think can, no, uh, yeah, basically, all to build on what just been said, uh, civil society can establish kind of a broad kind of framework we don't want nuclear tests or would like to stop the arms race, stuff like that. Uh, I don't really see a direct involvement of civil society into negotiations. Uh, and when it happens, it's not obvious it's going to be positive, by the way. <laughs> uh, yes, you do need experts uh, kind of to do that. So it, it's a lot of, well, you know, of back and forth, the civil society talks to experts, experts uh, do need to talk to civil society, so that interaction is uh, an absolute kind of must. There's interaction between countries at civil society levels, uh, all, all, all is very vital, but just let me uh, warn you that civil society is not always a positive force, all right? <laughs> so uh, we do have this like, optimist, oh my god, the people are going to speak out is that everything will be great, maybe, uh, but maybe not. So we have the civil society of, of in Armenia right now, of, uh, uh, well, you know, of, of replacing the prime minister, uh, trying to get rid of, 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 of corruption. Uh, yes, that's populism, yes, but it's a good populism, right? Because we like it, it's toward democracy and against corruption. But when we saw exactly the same populism in Germany, so, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, the alternative so, uh, for Germany, we say, oh my God, it's uh, truly so, uh, terrible, so, uh, just because it's conservative. But it's actually populism. Exactly the same populism, just going to so, uh, different ways in response to different so, uh, impulses. So if you involve civil society in Russia, for example, right now, I don't know what you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because the civil society in Russia is actually very conservative. Mm -hmm. I think that to, to so, add another uh, kind of it's not dimension to the, to the question, I mean, we're, we're using the term civil society probably in a very loose mm -hmm. sense. And so you can talk about you know, activist groups, you know, an ICANN-like uh, entity. Uh, you can also talk about uh, how individuals in the academic sphere and the NGO sector may help to set an agenda which may in fact directly impact on uh, negotiations involving states. You can talk about a training dimension. I mean, uh, one of the interesting things at this last MPT meeting where a number of us were present, I mean, I counted probably two dozen of my former students, um, probably, you know, 15 or more uh, delegations. Uh, I mean, we were surrounded with the Chileans, I mean, the Chinese on our right, the Egyptians behind us, uh, 
I mean, they were our students, not that they reflected our views necessarily, but they were educated here, and uh, there was a certain, uh, you know, shared, uh, at least said there was a, an ability to speak in an informal fashion about issues which, you know, could make a difference down the road as you built, uh, you know, a larger uh, community of that sort. And then, as Nikolai's alluded to, but one could even discuss this in a different fashion with respect to the Levan Treaty, uh, it was not simply uh, ICANN operating. ICANN received support from national governments. Uh, the intellectual uh, kind of basis for much of the uh, initiative was also funded by national governments. And so there's a linkage between uh, states and civil society, and they mm -hmm. play out in different uh, different ways. It's, I would argue, I don't know, I'm on camera here, but uh, I would argue that it was not uh, simply, it was not that surprising that ICANN received the Nobel Peace Prize, given the support that Norway provided to various parties associated with ICANN a half dozen or more years ago. And so it's a, an interesting question, but the, the answer is com also complex, which is what I usually end up saying <laughs> to any question. Uh, Great, thank you. Please. Yes. That's how life is. <laughs> I have more, more, a question more directly to Dr. Sokol, but any of you can jump in if you want. So you mentioned that in 2050, no, 1958, uh, the, the US Aeroton Act. Actually, the, the, the reason of all the, the U.S. actually support a lot uh, the creation of Aerotone because at the time was one of the a way of of stopping the spreading of nuclear weapons in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a success uh, besides France. Uh, but there was actually, uh, we talk about the, sometimes the Allies don't agree with, there was actually one act uh, in, in uh, 1978, the Nuclear non proliferation Act where actually the Europeans uh, fought really against hard uh, some of the, um, one of the provisions I think was about reprocessing mm -hmm. uh, uranium. And because the Europeans say that they claim that actually there was under the Aeroton, uh, US Aeroton Act, and this, actually, this new act in 1978 undermined that, that, that mm -hmm. commitment. Uh, my, my question is about, because I don't know much about this, what was the, actually the role of the Soviet Union at the time, when there was this kind of a, a clash between the, the Allies? You mean, which period you mean? In, in, in 1978. Oh, you know, I didn't really look at uh, the Uranium in the role in 78. Uh, generally speaking, the Soviet Union has always been suspicious about Close like arrangements uh, sort of, uh, in non-proliferation. Uh, uh, the Soviet Union absolutely did not like, for example, uh, on the fact that Uranium was allowed to inspect itself. Like it accepted that, but it didn't like it. All right. So, uh, uh, like as a general rule, like as I mentioned, the Soviet Union did actually uh, tend to stick to the strictest kind of possible line. So, some exceptions, yes, that's not, you know, 100%, but mostly is that was the tendency. Uh, so yes, there was a lot of suspicion of the Uratum, and although yes, I did not look, you know, all the sources, I'm pretty sure that I would find that the Soviet Union supported the United States and did try to prevent so, so, uh, reprocessing uh, if you wanted to check with somebody else, Sandy Specter, you know, in our DC office, yeah, at should. the time was working for Senator Glenn and helped to write the uh, uh, 1978 uh, yeah. Nuclear Non-Proliferation Act. So you might inquire of Sandy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are uh, about out of time. So first, uh, let me express my appreciation. Uh, to my colleagues who contributed uh, so substantially both to our research project and to the forthcoming book. And also thank you for your excellent questions. So please join me in thanking ourselves. Thank